Good morning, everyone, and welcome. What a beautiful morning. The sun is shining. My name is Reverend Tamara Merrill, and I'm a staff minister here at CSL Santa Cruz. And uh, my ancestors, ancestors come from, on my father's side, England and Ireland, and on my mother's side, Ireland and All Saints Lorraine, which is still in a debate whether it's German or French, but mostly French, <laughs> right there on the border. Um, this morning, I'd like to take us into some breathing, and here is how it's going to go. I want you, if I invite you, I would like you to breathe in through your nose six times, and then exhale through your mouth like a straw for six times, uh, the count of six. And we'll do this five times. Okay? All right. Let's go. Breathe in. One, two, three, four, five, six. Breathe out. One, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you, thank you. This morning, I wanna talk about the observation and gauging that we are committed to in the center. And I want to go back to talking about identities, our limited identities that get us into a lot of trouble. And as I was doing my homework this week, I came face to face with something that just was so hard for me to sit with. And that is, we are not our thoughts. Our thoughts are ours, but it's not us. It's not you. We um, have a body, but we're not our body. And as I was listening to many different speakers, they talked about intellect again, and talked about how the intellect is a gathering, kind of like um, a computer. It gathers information. It creates our personality by all the experiences and ideas that we have collected and gathered. So it's a heap of information, but it's not intelligence. And our bodies is the heap of food, right? Everything we eat. But it's not who we are. And then I realized, wow, I'm not my personality, which I'm very attached to my personality. I don't know about y'all, but, you know, I was like, who am I is that question, but if I'm not my personality, if I'm not all these things that I've gathered over my lifetime. We know how attached we are to our ideas and our sets of beliefs. That also get us into a whole lot of trouble because we have a hard time navigating in and out of it. And different people have given so many beautiful tools on how to navigate this life, right? And one of the most beautiful things was I realized that all the gathering is great. It's great information, especially if your intention is to grow. And then I heard this master talk about it is our nature to want more. Except we have it kind of twisted. It's our nature to want more, to expand, to grow, to be, to become enlightened. I mean, I think that's why we're all here, is to become more enlightened, to become more wise and less wounded. So, what we do with it is we turn towards the materialistic paradigm and try to get more, thinking that it will fill us up. Ah, more recognition, more love, more money, more stuff, more friends, more acknowledgement, 
fame, whatever the stuff is. And we want more, but not that kind of more. The more we are looking for, and it tends to be very difficult, because the more we want is the expansion of falling in love with the divine, falling in love with our own soul. And the only difference between me and you is my idea of you. So there we go, we're limited again. The only difference between you and I is my idea of you. That's it. How difficult that is, right? And I forgot to read my quote. <laughs> but that's okay. You know, um, it was about civility, about how to navigate some of our identities that we have become attached to because it is a navigation. And we all are here to work through a spiritual paradigm. Wanting more in a spiritual paradigm means we want to connect more with the divine. And it comes back to, like, in permaculture, when the kids were talking at the dinner the other night, they were talking about how, you know, if we have diversity when we grow plants, and Elijah was talking about that, like we tend to grow agriculturally in row crops of the same thing, you know, trying to become perfect, trying to become the perfect garlic or the perfect artichoke. And we sell those in the stores. Instead of allowing nature to give its bounty because of the diversity that you plant certain things next to other things that support it, and therefore, the land does not become depleted. The soil does not become depleted because of diversity, which I think is fascinating, right? And we have this ideologies of, of perfectionism and how life in the world is supposed to look. And the truth is, if we observe nature, carrots do not look like little miniature, like perfect cylinders. Carrots are crooked and gnarly and, and beautiful. But we have come to identify that a carrot's supposed to look like this. An apple's supposed to look like that. I don't know about y'all, but if you go to the store and you buy a carrot, I mean a carrot, an apple out of season, and it looks beautiful, and then you take a bite of it, you're like, hmm, that doesn't taste so good, right? It's because we have forgotten that diversity and life is about creation, and creation doesn't, doesn't do copycats, right? And we're all in this life trying to copycat what, what someone else's I ideas are, right? So I thought about perfectionism, and, and for us to think that we all are supposed to look a certain way, behave a certain way, we even do it to our agriculture. <laughs> you know, the carrots supposed to look like this. And I, I saw on TV shortly after that where there's this commercial that says, imperfect foods for you, you know, cheap foods if you take the imperfect fruits and vegetables. I think those are perfect, right? So we're talking about limited identities. That the more you can figure out through meditation, through mindfulness, to get the space that you can have a glimpse or an experience that you are not your body and you are not your thoughts. Just enough, just a peek. If you could just get a peek that you're more than that, then that's where wisdom comes. That's where spiritual growth comes. Because meantime, we're the hamster on the wheel. You know? More. I want more in the material paradigm. We want more in the spiritual paradigm. We want to become the fullest we can become in the sense of spirituality, of experience, of love. That doesn't come from the external. And we hear that all the time. It comes from the internal. So anyway, now I'm going to lift up my energy here, and I'm going to talk about, when we talk about spirituality, Spirituality is transcending limitations of the physical and the psychological. And here's a test. Who would you be if tomorrow 
Everything that you have gathered, everything that you ever thought you were, you lost your memory. Who would you be? What worries would you have? Because you don't know. I don't know if I'm in debt. (laughs) I don't know if I'm broke. I don't know if I'm rich. I don't know if I'm beautiful. I don't know if I'm talented. But you're still breathing. You're still you. How do we navigate that? And our emotions that we're so attached to is energy in motion. So what do you put your energy into to go into the wave of motion? Being observant and being of service is engagement. But let's look at a tree. We're, talking, we're doing permaculture. So here's this beautiful apple tree in my backyard. It gives me lots and lots of apples. We always are more concerned about the fruits than the roots always interested in the product, not the process. And the process of this tree is that it has to go deep and work very hard to extract from the earth its nutrients, (laughs) its food, and its water. And then, when it blossoms, the flowers are fragrant, they fall to the ground. Then the leaves come, they provide shade, homes for the birds and the bees, and then the fruit comes. The tree gives back the fruit to its source, right? The apples drop, the fruit becomes the source of which it then comes another crop. That is the observance of us looking at nature and our relationship to it. We must give back to the source. That's where we find our happiness. That's in service. That's in gratitude. And reminding our purpose, once we do find our enlightenment, we just don't go around saying, I got it and you don't. Sorry. (laughs) Sorry for you. (laughs) No. We are so full and we know who we are, and then the only difference between you and I is my idea of you, then that means that if you're still suffering, I'm going to go back and teach what I know. So I find that really, really interesting. So I'm going to tell a story. Here's the story. So I don't particularly value some of the values of this particular person, but I like the story. (laughs) So Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook, right? I'm jumping from nature to technology. Mark was into Facebook for about five years, and it was just at the university college level, and um, he wanted to take it to a different direction because it was growing big. So his mentor was Steve Jobs of Apple, right? And he decides, well, you know, Steve Jobs has all the resources on the planet, the best resources ever, to know where I should go with his Facebook. So he goes over, makes an appointment with Steve Jobs, gets to sit down, he asks Steve Jobs, he goes, I want some support to know where to take Facebook. It's been five years and it's growing. Steve Jobs closed his eyes and didn't say anything for a few minutes. And they say Mark was very uncomfortable. And he opens his eyes and he said, you need to go to an ashram in India for one month. Now, if you're thinking, what the heck does an ashram have to do with where I'm going to take my business, then you are in limited thinking. Mark did go, they say, to an ashram, and he discovered where he wanted to take Facebook. So limited thinking, that, that's a very, um, doesn't seem to correlate. It's not linear thinking, right? And in the same, in the same uh, video, this uh, gentleman who was researching big companies many years ago when we were back at Apple iPod 2, okay, it was coming out, um, Microsoft had this great phone that was called Zoom, Z-U-M-E. It was beautiful, it had a lot of technology, 
University. And so this entrepreneur went to visit um, the 12th man down in Microsoft to Bill Gates and asked, how do you invent things? How do you grow? And you know what he said? He said, well, we look at our neighbors, what they're doing. We look at Apple all the time. We're always trying to compete to get better than them. We're always looking at their technology. We're always looking at what is to make it better. What is to make it better? And he goes, we got this great phone here named Zoom. Isn't it beautiful? And you can have one. So he gave this entrepreneur this Zoom phone. It was beautiful. The next interview was with Apple. And again, about the 10th person down from Steve Jobs, right? And so the entrepreneur goes, hey, look what I have. It's already looking better than the pictures I've seen of the iPod 2. This is beautiful. Look at the design. Look at how gorgeous it is. And the gentleman said, yes, it's beautiful. I think it's going to work just as good as the iPod 2. And he goes, probably so. And that's all he said. Why? Because he says, we're not into competition. We're into innovation and creation. We don't have to look at what's been to create something new. And I thought, that's infinite thinking, right? That's infinite thinking. It's thinking outside the box of what already is to possibility. However, we have been so like programmed in a certain way that it's hard to get out of that programming. It's really difficult. We have to work at it. And so this limited thinking and these limited ideas, it's, we talk about infinite possibility, but we don't know how to get there because we're looking at it from the wrong place, I think. I think it's about coming to terms with letting go of everything, of pretending that we have lost our memory. Where do we go? Who are we? What are the questions that we're asking ourselves, right? And the things that we think are so absolute and so real aren't now in quantum physics, right? So here we go. Do you know that with ultraviolet light put on a diamond, it will disintegrate the diamond into nothingness? Light. So if we think that the invisible world is not powerful, just look at all around us how powerful it is. The questions that help when you're thinking about an unlimited identity is looking at a cosmic identity. Who am I? Who wants to know? Isn't that interesting? <laughs> who wants to know? Who is the who that's asking who am I? What is it that you want to know? What is it that you want to know? What do you think about? What motivates you? What's my purpose? And what am I grateful for? But I, I found who am I and who wants to know. I, I laughed pretty hard. Um, I can't, oops, ouch. Um, I can't go over enough that the fruits of our life come from the hard work we do. And then once we get them, the only way to enjoy them is to give back. And that's the observe and interact. Jane Goodall, I was listening to her, and she was talking about infinite thinking also and finite thinking. And she says, Every, everyone, everyone has a gift. Everyone has a purpose. Everyone makes a difference. And when I was young, I used to think, how come there isn't more Jane Goodalls in the world? You know, of all the people talking about how much they love animals and things, why aren't there more Jane Goodalls out there? And she goes, it's because people don't think they make a difference. You make a difference. You have a purpose. I'm trying to find um, this one thing. I'm, I didn't... Oh, 
boat here. I am lost. Not really. I will find it. Okay, here it is. This is from a book that Elijah asked me to read. So in my vacation um, in Florida, I read the book in two days. It was The Alchemist. I don't know if you all read that. It's a really charming, wise fable. And here's something that it says. Everything on earth is being continuously transformed because the earth is alive and it has a soul and we are a part of that soul. However, we rarely recognize it. The world has a soul and a voice in a language that when we become still and observe, we will know. Because people become so fascinated by the pictures and the words, they wind up forgetting the language of the soul from which they come. Isn't that beautiful? We have forgotten the language of our soul. And I, I always, one of my favorite quotes is, God speaks to us in a language without a tongue. It's our soul language. And we don't give it as much value as we give the value of all this dancing that we do, which is a platform, which is an expression, which is why we're he here also. But there's something bigger going on, right? Something bigger. And we tend to draw these lines in, our, in the sand of you and I, them and us, and we get into a lot of destruction, a lot of destructive behavior. And in that limited thinking and in that limited identity, of who we have, of I'm an American, I'm this, I'm that. People die for their belief systems, for their set of beliefs, instead of having a set of practices that we become wiser and understand something without a tongue in a language that we all know, but we haven't turned in the station to get the vibration of that, right? When we draw lines in the sand, is you're either for me or you're against me. That's a false dichotomy. That's a false dilemma. It is never either this or that, ever. Nature doesn't do that. It is never that. If we believe in infinite possibilities, it is never, you're either for me or you're against me. There are other available options, always, always. But if we just see from our limited memories of all the information we've gathered, and we think that's intelligence, then we're not observing very well because intelligence is in our body, intelligence is in the air we breathe, intelligence is everywhere. It's not necessarily just in the intellect. And when we think we have figured everything out and drawn lines of I like you, I don't like this, and of course there, is, there are people doing destructive things because they have forgotten their connection, they have forgotten their oneness, they have forgotten who they are then we're in trouble. So really, our spirituality is about remembering who we are and about going deep and trying not to be so attached to the things we think are right or wrong, but to look at it from a different place, a different perspective. And this gentleman said, you must have multiple lenses to be wise. So, I leave you with that. Thank you.